Learning. Learning. There are three kinds of learning, which I kind of blah, blah, blah about last time. Um, and we're doing inductive logic programming, which means someone gives us some data, and someone gives us some descriptions of some new stuff, well, or some descriptions of the training stuff, and the correct answers for the training stuff. And we're supposed to come up with a hypothesis that allows us to deduce the classification from the background knowledge and the description of the cases. Does this make some sense? So like we have some things that say like, um, things with four legs have legs. Uh, things that are like this are flat. And then we have some stuff like, it's got four legs and a flat thing on top and no back. And then here it says, it's a table. And then we're supposed to induce, hmm, tables are things with four legs with a large flat area and no supporting back thingy. Um, so that's, that's inductive logic programming. So the question is, can we possibly do that? Like on the one hand, oh my god, it's impossible. On the other hand, you're going to see a very simple algorithm does pretty awesomely in practice. Um, so here's some background data. Like, oh, Philip is Charles's father. This is from Russell and Norvig, and Russell is British, so this is the uh, royal family. Um, Mom is Charles's grandparent. That's the queen mother, I believe. Um, queen Elizabeth Beatrice. I don't know who, is there a Princess Beatrice? Does anybody know? Um, I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, the queen mother is not Harry's grandparent. Uh, I guess. I guess Elizabeth is Harry's grandparent, yeah. Um, and we have a little bit of extra background knowledge that we, we're, we're throwing in. So these are the answers. This is something that might be helpful to the learner. Like, hey, there's this concept, or yeah, there's this concept of parent, which says you're either a mother or a father. And we want to induce from all these examples, we want to induce the target concept grandparent. Wow, okay, so how do we do that? Uh, we want to learn some stuff, namely this stuff, that given this, would be able to generate this. Covering all the positive cases, like for each of these cases, we want to be able to generate it. And for each of the negative ones, we don't want to be able to generate this. If we, are, if we are successful in deducing that Spencer is the grandparent of Peter, then our concept of grandparent is wrong. So we want to cover the positive examples without covering the negative examples. So how are we going to do this? So here's how. It's just it, uh, laughingly easy. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, first we're going to select a hypothesis space. And then we're going to do a search in hypothesis space for a hypothesis that matches the data. So what's our space of hypotheses going to be? So we're going to look for short clauses um, that are close to horn. I don't remember why they're not horn, but maybe we'll figure that out. Um, so it's going to be a sequence of rules. And the rules are going to be like your grandparent if blah, 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 blah. Um, just like those horn clauses we were learning before where you say blah, 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 blah implies blah. Um, so like, you're a cat if you're a furry and you meow. Um, so our job is to cover all the, all the positives. And we're going to do that in a way where we never cover any negatives. So every time through this loop, we learn one more rule. And we remove all the positive examples that that rule correctly takes care of for us. OK? And as long as these rules don't cover any negative examples, then as long as we cover all the positives, we're going to have a good rule set. All right. So that's our the structure of our hypothesis space is just a coll this collection of rules, like a, a conjunction of, of horn clauses. That's, those are the, the, the we, if, if the target concept is not expressible that way, then we are not going to be able to learn it. Right? Just like we would all have trouble learning the concept grew. We're just not set up for that. Um, there are a lot of other things we're not set up for. Like, if it turned out that 
like gravity operated very differently on things if they had a little teeny microscopic protrusion on the right hand end then like you know we would not be very good at learning about gravity in a world like that because we're not good at perceiving those little teeny protrusion things like we can't even represent that um, well in our brain so um, okay so we go through so so we have a hypothesis class we're going to look for the best collection of rules we can every time through we try and build a new rule we start with the empty rule and then um, each time through, we're gonna we're gonna elaborate on the rule. We're gonna add another literal to the rule. So, I think we start off saying everybody's a grandparent of everybody, for every rule, and then we add, we constrain the rule, constrict it, by saying, well, okay, not everybody's a grandparent, just the people that are fathers are grandparents. I'll show an example on this slide here. So, you start off with this rule saying everybody's a grandfather. X, grandfather XY is true, like without preconditions of everything. So that's obviously wrong. So um, when we look at, okay, what literals can we add that will constrain this rule? We look at all the possible things we can add, all the single literal additions. So we're doing local search in hypothesis space. Right, Adam? So this is one thing we think of adding, and we notice that well, this does not work. If we look, run this over our training data, it's always wrong. And then we run this over our training data and we say, well, gosh, you know, this is not as bad as this, but it's pretty bad. Uh, it's got a ton of false positives. If you look at this, this actually doesn't have so many false positives. It's not quite correct, but it's the best of the current options. So we've improved the rule. It's not perfect yet, but it's improved. And so this one gets selected. And then if you look at all things to add to this, notice that this introduces a new variable. So you, the, when you think of adding a literal, you, do, you, think, you look at all possible combinations of variables you could put in here, including the introduction of a new one. Um, and in fact, the target concept is one of the next elaborations that will be considered. So in two steps, this procedure, this is called FOIL, for first order inductive learning, FOIL, um, in two steps, it learns the target concept. It just blows my mind that it's so efficient. Um, so, and I think I said, so the new literals you look at are any predicate over any variables where at least one of the variables in the, in the previous literal or the head. So the head is, is this part here. So at least one of the variables has to be in the head or another literal. Here when we do this, one is in the head and one is in a previous literal. Um, equal is something that you think of adding or a negation of something. And you choose the one that maximizes information gain. I'm not going to talk about information gain right now, but I promise you that when we get to supervised learning uh, of decision trees, we'll talk about this. Um, the clause must be shorter than the positives it explains. So one of the things that happens in when you're doing this FOIL routine you go around learning new rules. We take away all the positive examples. After a while, there might be only like one or two positive examples left. If, if this search procedure tries to learn some big long thing, like you're a grand, like if there's only one positive example left, that's uh, you know I don't know John is Susan's grandfather. Then if you learn something really long, like if you smoke a pipe and are lived in Durham and collect stamps and blah blah blah, then you're the grandfather. Then you're a grandfather. Like that's a much longer description than saying grandfather John of Susan. So um, it's generally true, rather magically. This is one of the great unexplained mysteries of the universe, as far as I know. Um, it's generally true that shorter descriptions generalize better. So uh, this is called Occam's razor because there was some philosopher a long time ago that said like, multiply not thy hypotheses, blah, 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 blah except he said it in Latin. Um, <laughs> uh, so his, his name was Occam. So it's called Occam's razor because you, uh, you try and just shave off any complications in your theory to make it as small as possible. Um, so yeah, isn't that just amazing? I just think, like, why should the universe be designed so that we could possibly understand it by choosing things that we like because they're short? 
Like the universe does not have to be that way. It does not have to be that way. It could have been very different. Yeah. Which is why I guess I don't know, I didn't want to start an argument. I guess maybe some of you <laughs> So 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 if if the only clause you can learn is longer than the positives it explains, then you say, Hey, I'm done. I can't learn any more general rules. I tried, I failed, I'm done. I have the best rules that I can learn. It might not be perfect, but you should be happy because you didn't have anything when we started and I learned something. Um, Dan. The question that cuts into the heart of every instructor. Uh, but I know you're only asking uh, for informational purposes. And I think it has to do with logic. So I'd say, yeah. When we get to planning, the answer is no. And I think planning, well, we, we haven't gotten to the slides for today. The, uh, the, the planning stuff, we're not going to talk about planning on the exam. But there was even something on your practice exam that I haven't even talked about yet. I don't know if you noticed in the short answers, it asks about the qualification problem, and I haven't even told you what that is. So we better not die in the next 40 minutes. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's something yet to learn. <sighs> you look disappointed by my answer. I apologize. <laughs> Isn't it funny that you know, no, it's not actually true. Sometimes professors say, well, I gave them so much stuff, they can't learn that all in depth, so I better give them very shallow, superficial, stupid questions about it. But you've all seen in practice exams. You know what my exams are like. So you were probably worried before. You, so there's no different now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Foil. Yeah. What's, what's, what's one of the problems with this learning algorithm? See if you guys so think. Yeah, yeah, Nathan. Um, Shout out. What's up? You said first you have to decide, like, <coughs> when you said something like what form the rule is in. Hypothesis based. When, yeah. we, desi when we start designing a learner, so FOIL so has a very particular hypothesis space in mind. Does the programmer decide the hypothesis space, or does the, the algorithm decide the hypothesis space? Deep question. Um, um, this program, this learning algorithm, does hill climbing mm -hmm. in a hypothesis space to learn something. The hypothesis space is fixed. It's like okay. all these sets of horn rule, hornish rules. Okay. Um, so it could be that the thing we want to learn is not expressible <coughs> by hypothesis in that form, in which case we'd we would want to use a different learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always just wanted to, to make sure you knew what the hypothesis space meant. So that's why I brought it up. Yeah. It's not, there's nothing fancy going on here. That's, it's a fixed hypothesis space that the programmer has built into the algorithm. It's, um, but there are all sorts of fancy schmancy systems people have built where the system tries to figure out what kind of hypothesis space and it gets as fancy as you want. But we're not going to talk about any of that. Kendall, you good? Everything's good. Okay. Foil. Other questions about it? Oh, wait. We were going to talk about how it sucks. Uh, I've been stressing how awesome it is. And in fact, I think I even have another page showing all the awesome things it has done. Um, inductive logic programming has been used to in induce the rules of chess. Right? You look at a board position. You look at another board position. Could this, is this a legal successor state? So then you learn the successor function in chess. Um, it's been uh, one of the big successes has been in um, mutagenesis and toxicity prediction. So um, um, this is predicting what stuff causes cancer, and this is predicting what's going to kill you. Um, cancer doesn't usually kill you for a long time, but it's like what causes the cancer and what causes immediate death. So, and you can apply this to chemical formula. Um, so. Uh, drug companies, for example, are very interested in this because apparently I'm no physicist or physician rather. I'm no physician. I'm not a physicist either. But uh, apparently people design all these great drugs except that they like kill the person. <laughs> like, it, like it totally cures them of whatever they had but it has some lethal side effect where like, hey, like you no longer have cancer but you can't breathe or something like that. So 
um, predicting what drugs are going to be toxic without having to test them on animals or people or whatever is very, very useful. And oftentimes, the things that cause drugs to have particular properties are expressible in logic. You can say, like, if you have this particular combination of things in concert with this and maybe not that, I mean, you have some Boolean expression. Um, if there exists a blah blah blah, you know, at the end of this chain, then blah 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 blah. Um, so you want all the expressiveness of logic um, in order to make these predictions. So these are some big success stories. Um, there used to be an annual toxicity challenge where people would publish new data sets and you'd try to predict stuff. Um, if you're into AI, then this is also very exciting. Um, people have used ILP to induce parsers. So you show someone, like, this is an English sentence, and then this is the meaning of that sentence in first-order logic. And then you build, it, it infers a rule that, like, goes from surface structure into meaning. It's, like, very, very cool. Um, so ILP has had a number of notable successes. It's, it's widely used. Why does the algorithm we talked about suck? So I'll go back here. Pay special attention to this line here. Yeah. Why does this algorithm suck? Kendall. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's just local search. So there could be a, a, a good rule set, a hypothesis, uh, that, and we just can't find it because our search is bad. Like we can't get there by greedy hill climbing. Like the first literal you have to add looks like it sucks. Um, and maybe there's no other way to get to the target concept. Yeah. So it, it is absolutely incomplete. Yeah. That's a great point. But it's it's there's even it sucks in even an additional way. And 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 I want to I want to focus on that quantifier there, and that quantifier right there. So you have you build up your rule while it's covering any negative examples, and you keep building new rules until you've covered all the positives. Could there be cases where you wanted to leave some negative examples, some like false? Some, what, you wanted to allow some false positives, or you wanted to allow some unaccounted for positives. Could we ever have cases like that, where we actually wanted to learn something that wasn't 100% accurate? Lee? Well, we're always trying to deal with stuff we don't, I mean, that's why we're doing the learning, usually. If we knew the answer, we wouldn't have to, to have some algorithm figure it out. That's an extremely optimistic view. Yeah. Um, do you ever see the data sets coming back from the Hadron Collider? They, they I mean, I haven't either, but the, the, uh, they, they have these pictures of like, here's the data we expect to get and why you should pay us like $10 billion to build this thing into a mountain. Um, and it's, it's like, and they're like, this picture completely proves the existence of the Higgs boson. Yeah. Um, right? There's like there's noise in the data. Now maybe once we build the world's perfect collider, we build the most perfect detector, then we will have and we'll have infinite data. Then there will never be any noise, and we'll have perfect knowledge of the state of the universe. But in my experience, usually there's always a little bit of crap. Like you're never perfectly sensing what temperature it is, you know, or you measure the temperature in one part of the beaker, and there are other parts of the beaker where the temperature is a teeny tiny little bit different, um, and you can't measure the temperature in all parts of the beaker because then there'd be no room for the liquid; it would be all thermometer everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so there's always going to be noise in your data. There's always going to be noise in the data. Well, there's this great French philosopher. Uh, Laplace, I think it was, who said, you know, if we could measure everything and if we understood the rules of the universe, then we could predict the future. Uh, and it's just a great thought experiment, but it, like, it could never work because you'd have to have the universe would be full of measuring devices and there'd be like nothing happening in the universe except the measuring. Um, 
but you wouldn't know what the answer to the measuring was because you hadn't measured. Uh, it would be, anyway. So, so there's always noise in the data. So if you have some simple algorithm like FOIL that's like, we're not going to cover any negative examples, even if it's a wrong negative example. Like this happens all the time. Like some doofus clicks the wrong number of stars in their Netflix queue and says, you know, I thought Total Recall was the best movie ever. And then you're like, but wait, they liked On Golden Pond. I can't formulate a new recommendation for this person because their views are completely inconsistent. Like, uh, you know, they love Schmaltz and Arnold Schwarzenegger. I just can't reconcile this. So there's always going to be noise in your data. So if you do this, where you have to learn something that, that doesn't cover a single negative example and covers every single positive example, your target, the concept you learn is going to be so enormous and baroque that uh, it will not generalize at all. Like that's called overfitting. You overfit the data. Like you take the data too seriously. Um, I think I showed an example uh, last class where, oh, this is a beautiful example, and I get to do it in color. I love this. Um, like, here are the axes, and here's your data. And, I mean, in my view, a nice explanation of this data is that. But you notice that that line covers only one, two, three data points out of like 20. Right? So it's actually like a poor fit to the data from a certain point of view, like from a computer's point of view, where it's like very rigidly trying to be. So I could learn, if I wanted to have a more expressive hypothesis class, I'll do this in green because it's slimy. Um, I, I could learn this explanation for the data. Oh, I missed a data point. Ah, oh, I'm not doing a very good fitting job. Well, this does, this, this new hypothesis, so here my hypothesis space was like all lines. So there's only two parameters in that hypothesis space. Here, it's like all degree 100 polynomials, perhaps, is my hypothesis space. So I get 100 knobs to turn, and since you only gave me 20 data points, I can turn those knobs and make the function go through the data. But I'm totally overfitting, like crazy. Like, if the, if the data fact is generated by a linear process with additive noise, then if someone puts in, hey, I, I'm putting in an x value here, what y value should I expect? You're going to guess up here, when in fact the true data is going to be centered around this red thing. So you're going to have higher error because you're overfitting to the noise. And that's a general feature of, of learning algorithms, and that's why we actually love simple hypothesis classes because they tend not to overfit and therefore to generalize better. Whew. So that's one of the problems with FOIL, is uh, it's not noise tolerant. It totally flakes out if, uh, so that's like the kind of question I would ask on an exam. I wouldn't say like, you know, here's some first order logic, quick run FOIL, because like I haven't told you what information gain is, and well, I don't know, maybe I could do that. No, okay. <laughs> I was just, well, because you, if you just like add another literal, well, anyway, so, uh, yeah, question. And so, that kind of stuff in the paper? Where oh, this is getting too deep. It was um, a difficult why? Because that was wrong. Oh, that's, I, I drew this example with the simple hypothesis generating the data. So it fits. Yeah, but how do we know that that's the case in reality? Yeah. yeah. But it is true in this case. Yeah, it's true. This is an example of Occam's razor, but why should the universe be like this is my question. But let's not, let's just like put that, there should be a philosophy class about that. Isn't it more complex to force that algorithm into finding a general <coughs> answer, finding a less specific answer than it is to get it to overfit? Actually, the computations for doing linear regression are like closed form, very simple. Whereas fitting a 100 degree polynomial, you have to do really fancy linear algebra. But you have to recognize the situations where you want to do that. Oh, <sighs> meta, meta issue. Which just makes it more math, right? Oh, wow. So having an algorithm that automatically tuned the hypothesis class to the problem. Yeah, you guys are getting way advanced. Like, I, especially for someone who doesn't want to see this kind of stuff on an exam. Um, 
can we talk about this later? Let's talk about this in the learning part of the class. There's, um, there's, there's, there's work on that, but it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of outside the scope of the class. But yeah, when we get to the learning part of the class, remember how there's only one part of lo thing in logic you need to remember, which is that implication is not A or B. Um, for, for, for the learning section of the class, there's also only one thing you need to remember, which is called cross-validation. So when we get to that part, then that's the, the answer on any exam when you can't think of what to say is going to be cross-validation. Yeah, and it takes care of this how do we tune the hypothesis class to make sure that it's motivated by the data. 